Welcome to season four of my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I've added the title Between Us, as I thought Stories of Unconscious Bias alone was a little too remote. My hope was that the podcast would feature honest and personal stories that raise awareness and educate. Between Us, as a main title, underlines the intimacy while reinforcing the sense of our collective involvement. Since launching it in early May 2020, the world has again changed. George Floyd died, and Black Lives Matter, which had started in 2013, has become more popular and more widely accepted. Identity politics and culture wars have deepened in the UK and the US. Meanwhile, in other countries, people are being marginalized for their religion and beliefs. The need to understand the subject of unconscious bias has taken on ever more meaning and resonance. As always, I am so grateful to all my wonderful speakers who share their often brave stories and allow us to understand the nuances of this very important subject. Thank you for listening. Hello. I'd like to introduce Indira Kora Luvalia. Indira is an activist and entrepreneur turned advisor, coach, and now an author. She's worked in federal government contracting, particularly international development, to build equity, acquaintability, acquaintability, accountability, and sustainability. And these are for countries all around the world, but she's based in Virginia in America. As Indira fulfilled her life's passions and professional obligations, busy girl that she is, she was then diagnosed with stage four advanced breast cancer with bone metastases at the age of 38. Well, her fight and the lessons she learned led her to write a very incredible book called Fast Forward to Hope, Choosing to Build the Power of Self. It's a memoir to enable others to face and walk beyond their own issues. Because it doesn't just have to be about cancer. We all are faced with challenges. How do we deal with these challenges? How can we manage them? And there's one more little thing I want to tell you about Indira. Indira is a single mother to her teenage children. Well, they weren't always teenage, so she was a single mother to littler children. But Indira says to me that she loves the sound of children's laughter, her mother's cooking, and sitting on the beach watching the sunrise. And actually, you know what? Those three, I completely agree with Indira. Thank you so much for sharing your stories of unconscious bias with me. Thank you, Smitha, for having me on your podcast. It's really a privilege to to speak from my truth and learn about the, these issues as we talk together. So I'm excited about about talking with you today. I, I'm, and, I'm I'm excited too, but but you know, I mean, I I want to talk about. Um, stuff that you've learned and and stuff is the wrong word, but lessons that you've learned, uh, which has made you write the book. But let's not even before we even go there. I just I want you to tell us what you understand by unconscious bias. You know, I think unconscious bias is um, one of our defense mechanisms. And I say that because we use our bias to protect ourselves. Sometimes the bias is about other people or ourselves, but ultimately bias becomes a habit. And that habit is the lens through which we see the world in a way that is comfortable for us. But I also have to say bias um, has a neurological basis as well. It comes from the way our brain is conditioned. It, we get bombarded with stimulus. We take it in in what we see, in what we hear, in what we interpret. And the issue is that as we're taking in millions of bits of information per second, our brain can only consci consciously capture about 50 pieces per second and process seven. So as we get bombarded with information, we jump to what we think we already know to complete the picture sometimes to safeguard ourselves, sometimes to interpret a situation. So, you know, I, I look at bias and say, am I seeing the full picture? You have to sort of train yourself to live beyond your defense mechanisms is the way um, I try to respond. Well, no, and what you've said is, is, is to me, uh, uh, you've said it so beautifully because it really is, and, I, and the phrase that I often use when we talk about unconscious bias uh, is, I, you know, I want to keep safe. Yes. Uh, and so you use the word defense, but it's the same thing. 
I want to be safe and to keep safe, my brain says, don't do this or don't go there. Uh, and that then protects me. And that's one way of looking at it. Uh, and so absolutely. I love the fact that you presented it like that. And you're absolutely right. But then what did that look like? I mean, could you could you share some stories with us, Indira? Absolutely. You know, I, I think about an example from when I was a child. And I think I must have been about five years old. And it's funny because these very early memories are, are what define you. And and I, I was in a in Minto Park actually in Calcutta growing up there and my brother and I had just stepped out to play and my brother maybe I was five or six because my brother's five years um, younger than me and so he'd come out with me and as we came out from from our uh, ground floor apartment we came to where all the drivers were sitting and the drivers uh, started laughing and actually said, oh, what is that on your head to my brother? And you know, I was like, what are they talking about? Because oftentimes you get so accustomed to your own self and garb that you don't see what others see. And uh, they were referring to his top knot, his, his jura, his bun, that little Sikh boys and grown adult Sikh men also have on top of their head. And as a, probably a seven-year-old child, I said, oh, my God, what is wrong with them? They're adults and they don't know that's hair. They're thinking that's a potato. Um, it, just, it just was so incredulous to me that adults could be so judgmental. And, and honestly, so in my childlike manner, I thought stupid. And I, I sort of laughed out loud and said, you don't know what that is? That's a jura. That's his hair. And... As I thought about this, when I started doing diversity work um, in my career, when I was a, a much older, naive person, um, I realized in that moment, the bias of others gave me strength. It gave me the opportunity to be confident, actually, and accept all of my identity, even at that very young age. You know, I don't even know if my brother is aware of that incident. I mean, he... You know, we all go through our own interpretations of situations as they come up. But this is such a great story. And I, I just wanted to, to add to that, because when you were sharing the story, I was thinking of something that I had heard on some other podcast not so long ago. And the idea about how we protect ourselves because of our sense of our own identity. And that story that I heard was of a young woman who was crazy about basketball, if I'm not mistaken, in somewhere in the United States, uh, a black American, a, a, an African-American girl in the United States who was crazy about basketball and so crazy about it. She was finally in the school team and then she was representing the, the town and so on. And she was the only non-white kid in her team. And she was in the bathroom combing her hair or getting ready before she went out to play. And a whole bunch of children came and other girls in the ladies' room and started giggling and looking at her. Now, you and I both might guess why they were giggling and looking at her, because they were not used to seeing someone who was black, because the community they lived in was predominantly white. But she wasn't aware of that. She was just so focused on her game. That's right. That she went out there and she won the game. Of course. Whereas if yes. she had taken the real meaning from those giggling children, she might have lost the game. That's right. And that's what you're saying to me. And that's a brilliant story. No, because absolutely. you won your game in so many ways. But sorry, keep keep going in there. I just, no, no, I'd absolutely. love to hear more. No, and I, I think it's it's that dichotomy, right? I mean, even as we use our biases to judge others and protect ourselves, we don't often realize how much the other is doing the same about us. Mm -hmm. And this mirroring of truth, doing it without the safeguards doing it with authenticity, doing it from a perspective of fearlessness, perhaps is where the magic is, but it's a very, it's, it's, it's a tough road to walk, to own your authenticity, because we're, we're, we're trained to behave in certain ways, we're conditioned by what we see in, in the media, or we hear in terms of what it would take to advance in particularly um, corporate environments. But so you, you, know, you have done far more than, than, than um, write a book um, because, you, you know, you were a successful entrepreneur. In fact, you sold, I think, two companies, if I'm not mistaken, and, and, 
and and you've done it. You've done. You've you've had many successes in your life. Alongside, of course, you you ended up being a single mother uh, to two little children, and of course, um, subsequently, you also had cancer and, and and a very late stage, fourth stage um, cancer. But along all these ways, what kind of stories did you get for yourself? Did you acquire about unconscious bias when you when you look back in hindsight? No, thank you, Smitha. Um, you know, one company I've I've, uh, I've supported the growth of uh, many companies, but certainly uh, founded and developed and sold one company that was focused on uh, gender inclusion and monitoring of the per impact of programs. You know, the the first thing I learned from entrepreneurship was having a faith in yourself, having faith in yourself. You know, you. When you, when you put yourself out there, you're putting yourself out there based on a vision or a spark or a desire to make something better. And you have this incredible strength of conviction that you can, no matter what reality says. And you know, I call this a brand of delusional leadership that changes <laughs> the world for the better. And uh, thank God I've been gifted with a lot of good, good healthy delusions. And starting DTS was really about looking at development from the perspective of the impact uh, two partners, a do, uh, the donor and the host government come to in trying to make change, be it in education or democracy or economic growth. And what I particularly found missing was the sense of identity, the sense of how it impacts the woman who waits for a bus that doesn't come because it usually comes when the man leaves the house in the morning rather than when the woman has to pick up the work, uh, pick up the bus after she has done her household chores. So the idea of contextualizing development to local needs with an interpretation of cultural um, like fluency is, is what, I, what I worked on. And it's one of those situations where I think it stood me in good stead, these good delusions about wanting to believe you can, regardless of what but, reality tells you. Which I think is easy for us to say or to articulate. But I just want to remind the listeners that there was a period in your life, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one closely followed on the heels of the other, which is your marriage falling apart, you have two mm -hmm. tiny children, and then you're being diagnosed with advanced breast cancer fourth stage. Am I am I correct in saying that? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, I mean, and we... so they were almost parallel, and they were going on in your life. So how on earth are you? So what <laughs> happens? Tell us a little bit about your unconscious bias stories going on at that time. Right. So there were there was another factor. I mean, I, I got diagnosed, um, and and in the book, I spend a lot more time talking about the diagnosis rather than the treatment. The I find that the diagnosis period when you know something is not right in your body and all that you have to do to discover what it is. And you're doing that from the seat of fear, even as you try to be incredibly rational and systematic about trying to get to the point of treatment was going on. The marriage was already struggling and you know, it when some when you're in the midst of a struggle, you don't see how how deep you are in the struggle sometimes, and that had been debilitating for a while. Uh, the kids were babies, five and three, um, and this wonderful business idea that had taken off uh, had its first significant blow. So, two thousand six <laughs> was an. I'm interesting laughing year. because there's no there's not much point to start crying because I mean, could it get any worse? Would be my question. 2006, no, it, yeah, keep yeah. going. And it could absolutely get much worse, right? Because it, I think where it could get worse is how you choose to handle it. I had, um, I had a friend I called actually as I was diagnosed, getting, getting into the building of my office and I was calling people to let them know, calling friends to let them know about the diagnosis. And he said, where are you? I'm going to come right there and we'll, we'll, we'll sort this out. And I said, oh, I'm just going to the garage. I can't talk right now because, you know, I've got to get to work. And he started laughing. He said, you're, just, you're going to be just fine. And I said, okay, please, please, please tell me what you see because I need all, all of that hope. And he goes, you're still moving. You're still putting one foot in front of the other and you're still saying you can. And I think that to me was recognizing that 
I had made a choice without necessarily being conscious that my children were too little. There was no way, no way that I wasn't going to be a mother to them through, through thick and thin. I needed to put money on the table and pay the rent. And I, I needed to resolve my scenario with cancer, but it wasn't going to own my outcome. But then so, I want to ask you something, Indira, because, you know, when I said, because we're talking about unconscious bias and how that right. affects you. And you said unconscious bias is about, I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, yes. but it's about perhaps creating habits. So yes. I, what I'm trying to understand, because clearly the listeners and I hearing your story are impressed and are thinking, my God, this woman is incredible. Hardly. And that, you know, well, but because you are, because all these things are falling about you like a pack of cards and you got on with it. And of course, uh, there may be many other people like you, but there are many other people who are not like you, who have not been able to get on with it. And so what kind of unconscious biases or habits, for want of a better word, do you think were embedded in you that were influencing you the way that made you make those decisions? You know, I think I have always relied on faith. I've always relied on my friendship with God. And it's been possibly, and, and I think that was subconscious. I don't think, I think I was always aware that I could talk to God. And it's one of those situations where the talk to God is a form of spirituality. It's a, it's a form of connecting to yourself. And when you do it from that perspective of spirituality, you do it without bias because you're in deep, you're in your embedded conscience, so to speak, and you can talk freely, freely about your fears, but also desperately about the outcomes you want. And, you know, I've always been able to be honest with myself. I, I've been able to rely on I've been able to rely on my own grit, perhaps. And, it, and I think that grit comes from my father who had, who lived, uh, who lived with cancer himself for several years, but never stopped doing what he needed to do in his life. And it was one of those, um, I, I, it, that was my training. So if you think about it from that perspective, where I had this incredible role model who had faith, who had ambition, who had capacity that was limited in different ways, but he chose to step over it. So with that kind of basis, I think that my conditioning or my bias was in saying I can because I know it's possible. And I think that's one of the reasons I wrote the book because even if I took the first step forward unconsciously or subconsciously, I want to make it conscious for others that you can. And that's, I mean, and that's wonderful. And that's, I mean, that's why you've written the book and I'm, and I'm very pleased that you have. But what's also interesting is about your narrative, your life experiences, because, you know, until two minutes ago, what we know of you is what you've told us that in 2006, all of these things happened to you. But now we have another additional piece to your puzzle, which is the fact that your father had cancer, but lived and worked and, and was successful and focused and energetic and all of that. And so he was a role model to you. And so if I would change it slightly, that story that you've said in the context of what you and I understand as unconscious bias, that became a habit in you, didn't it? It was kind of embedded. This is normal. Normal this life. Is normal. His dad's got cancer. Right. And yes. he gets home with stuff because you think exactly. it's not all oh, no, what I, it's not it's none of that. It's just normal. No. And because it's, it's normal, when it hits you, it doesn't hit you the way maybe it would hit somebody who has never been connected to cancer in any way. Right. But you know, whether it's the cancer in terms of the disease or the cancer of racism or the cancer of infidelity or the cancer of other conflicts or challenges. You know, there, it's our choice. When something happens to us, regardless of the conditioning, regardless of the programming that the world does for us, what our choice is, if we're, if we're stuck in the box, it's our choice to become conscious, conscious about our 
ability to break the box. And it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It has to be a decision in my mind. And I think that was a fundamental point in, in my journey is there was no question about whether I was going to live or die. There was absolutely, that was not up for debate even with God. It was a decision I had made. I was going to live. I was going to live and I wasn't going to compromise on how I wanted to live. Now, did I have any, did my decision have any merit? Did I have any evidence to prove that I could? You know, this comes back to my wonderful capacity to be delusional. And that sense of delusional hope or that sense of that depth of desire, you know, that is a capacity we all have. And so it's, it's tapping that, it's touching that, it's opening that up, it's doing that with some degree of faith that, yeah, there might be something there. It doesn't even matter if we don't get to the nth degree of it, but at least if we open the door, that, that moves the process forward. That's beautiful. But when, we, when you're thinking about what you went through at that time, so you have your faith, you have your, your wonderful you know, beliefs of delusional beliefs, which I, <laughs> I, I love that word. It's, every time you say it, I start smiling. And I think it's great. And I think we all need to, to, to have delusions. In fact, there was someone I interviewed recently um, who I posted, Robin Showhead, who's, who's a therapist. And he says, as long as we can accept that we're all mad, I think that's the word, insane is the word he uses. Insane. And if we, as long as you can accept that we're all insane, uh, then we can just get on with things, you know, I mean, just accept that. And I think that, you know, and you're saying it slightly differently, but it's, it is really about creating reality that works for us. And that's what you're saying. And I, I think love that makes that. sense. But, I love but that. So, so what does that then look like? Because here you are with all of these things, you know, running around, milling around with stuff around you. But how did you, what, did you experience other people's unconscious biases towards you? Yes. I mean, was it, yes. could, could you possibly share a story? What did that look like? Absolutely. And this is where it's interesting because people are conditioned to treat you the way they have been trained. So even in the medical professional, uh, even in the medical profession, as you can imagine, I've, I've been to every kind of specialist and every kind of doctor and every hospital system. And there are those doctors who held my hand, who told me that I could fight, who told me that this wasn't a death sentence, uh, who listened and heard all of my being and my desires. And then there were other doctors who were afraid to treat me. Even, you know, there was one instance where a doctor refused to test my cholesterol because she said, I needn't worry about it given my stage of cancer. And, you know, the other thing that sometimes doctors will do is they'll put a ceiling on your life. They'll give you their choice of your time of death. And, you know, it's, and you can look at both ends of the spectrum. You have, you ha I've had a doctor hold my hand and make me promise I'm going to fight. I've had another doctor give me two to four years to live in 2007. What do I choose? They're both experts. They both, they both have influence, they have authority, they're speaking from a place of evidence. And this is where I have to go back into myself and say, what is it that I want? What is it that I need to hear? What is it that I need to let into my body, into my system? And being alert to when somebody is holding you down is, is really hard, especially when that person has authority or you trust that person. The idea of staying so focused, in my case, of saying nothing is going to get in the way of my living. And, you know, as selfish as that sounds and appropriate as it was as a mother of a three-year-old and five-year-old, I never strayed from that. I, and but that's literally... incredible because, I mean, again, what you're saying just reminds me of, of another story that somebody else shared with me when they were going through a very, very difficult uh, traumatic period in their life and they were reaching out to, to a, a very close uh, relative. But that close relative was only able to see the glass half empty. And yes. so every time they spoke, that relative, all they could do is speak negatively. Right. And therefore, this person started feeling they were drowning. 
And, and how do you then have the wisdom to say, you know, however much I love you, dear relative, whoever you are, aunt or, you know, uncle or whoever it is, I, I, I need to avoid you because if I don't avoid you, how do I survive? How do right. I learn to swim? Is that's what you're trying to say? I'm trying because I'm trying to understand this because, you know, your understanding and concept, you've lived with it and you've, you've figured it out. But I'm really trying to simplify it both for myself and for the listeners. Yes. And it's very simply what you're saying is that when the chips are down and you know who your immediate circle, I know your example was, was a person of authority who you respect, who is a doctor, but it could be your sister. Or, or right. your uncle or your mother or someone who you love, not even not even respect, but who you have a close connection to. But their attitude and the way they communicate is not going to lift you and help you believe in yourself because that's their story and that's how they are. Right. And now you're talking about my marriage, right? I wasn't actually. How <laughs> no, funny no, you said I mean, that. <laughs> And, and I'm not necessarily. I, I, There's I your that unconscious <laughs> bias, <laughs> right? But and go I don't on then. Necessarily, exactly. I don't necessarily mean you were specifically talking about it, but that was a good segue into. Who, was it scenarios. really? Well, well, do tell me a scenario. So there well, you were, I mean, a single mother. What happened before? I mean, right, I, it's, I, it's just it's interesting. I'm laughing, but I'm I'm only laughing <laughs> because we're we're just kind of being positive about everything of that course, could have been course. challenging. But I just well, want the listeners to also take away from this. So yes, please do tell, well, tell I us. I mean, I think, and your point is well taken. It. I have to say that my, you know, I've been. <laughs> we've all been in situations where we haven't felt valued, or we haven't felt heard, or certainly when we've felt held down, right and. I think the, the the lesson I learned in those moments uh, probably took a long time to come to fruition. It's I, one of our most critical biases ab is about our own selves. And I think what it is, is that we think we can't. We think we're not enough. We think that we can't respect ourselves. We think we are not able to demand that respect of ourselves. So when it is that relative that's holding you down, somebody you trust, somebody you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, we're also conditioned to accept the relationship as much as the status quo of that relationship. And the biggest bias that I think I have worked through is my own sense of self, right? Because when you are in a, in a difficult situation, that's when you need the power of the self to be the most predominant. And that's when you're also at your weakest because you're feeling vulnerable or you're feeling that the risks of changing the status quo are greater than being in the status quo. And so fighting in those moments um, are, really, are really to exercise your own being. And that's hard fought. I mean, I don't know that there's a magic, magic bullet, but it comes to you in moments when you're quiet, not when you are struggling. So I think if I was to look at those moments in my life where I've had greatest understanding is when I have devoted that five minutes to myself, where I've cut out everything and everybody else and I've just sat in my own silence. Um, you know, I'm not an expert in meditation. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, somebody who can explain how and what that works. But that self-meditative space, that quiet space where you allow yourself your own truth, comes out quietly and simply. And you know, and sometimes for me, it's in writing. It's in writing uh, that I hear myself. It's in talking to a friend I really fully trust that she mirrors back what I really want that I haven't put into words. So I think in situations where we're challenged, if we find that minute or five minutes of breathing time, of letting our truth come to the surface or engaging with trust with somebody else allows us to free that delusion of us being enough. I'm just nodding um, because that, that I mean you've you've said it you know how do you manage your unconscious biases was the question I was going to ask you uh, uh, and it and you're suggesting that it is really about 
me time, you know, if, if you know, nowadays, especially during p- the pandemic right. um, and, and, you know, single parent or even double parents, little children never leaving the house, depending on which country we're living in, it can be a bit of a hothouse and it can be extremely challenging. And right. how then do you find that me time um, just to be quiet in your own self? But what I found particularly powerful is that the me time is, yes, you can go into the metaphorical you know, bubble bath and lie there with a glass of wine and some candles. But while you're there, be true to yourself. That's the bit that I thought was very key. It's yes. about being being honest with where you are and how you see yourself. But then how do you do that, Indira? I'm still figuring that one out. How do you do that? What do you do specifically? Is it just a feeling? What I mean, could you could you tell us what you actually do? How do I do that? It's, or is it a mantra? You, is it a repetitive it, thing you say to yourself? Is no, it something that simple? I wish it were. I wish it were. I think that we each have our own journeys. And I'm thinking, you know, it, I never had that time. I've never had that time for the for the bubble bath, right? I mean, so my moments of quiet have come um, as I've locked myself in the bathroom, per se, with the kids clamoring right outside the door when they were little. And I was trying to juggle all of it. Is is saying, okay, this is for my sanity that I want to get two minutes to myself so I I don't come out yelling. Um, It's hearing that I am really tired. It's hearing that I really want to do do well by my kids, but I really need to be happy. I really need to be able. It's, It's allowing yourself your wishes. It's hearing what those wishes may be because you know, for the longest time, I didn't know what my favorite color was because I'd never focused on it, right? Knowing what your favorite color is so critical. It's not as it ties to your wardrobe, but it's all of a sudden, it's understanding how to build the truth about yourself. So figuring out what you really want from from knowing your favorite color, from knowing what solitude looks like for you, what in terms of how you communicate who you are is how people will respond to you as well. You know, my response is an example to the person, to the doctors, two doctors who told me the two to four years in a serious consultation was, I'm leaving, I'm not coming back. And please do not assign, you know, the death stamp to anybody else that walks in this office is, is being so clear about your mission that once you figure out, yes, this is my favorite color, not everything has to be a purple, but knowing that that's where you're going, that's where you're going to be happy. I'm not sure if any of it makes sense. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I, and the reason I'm silent is I'm processing it myself, as I'm sure my listeners are, um, because it, it is, you know, we, all of us have life is cyclical, we have ups and downs, and every one of us would have had some challenge in our life. And how did we manage those challenges, even as basic as taking care of little children when you're physically exhausted? Forget the cancer, forget the single mom. That's but just right. being physically exhausted and not shouting at them, which I can bet you most parents will say, oops, I've been there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> instead of going, then lock your door on the toilet, sit on the toilet seat for a little longer than you need to sit yes. and take a deep breath. I mean, it's something that simple and say to yourself, this is about me and how physically exhausted I am. Let me try and catch myself because when I open that door, I want to try and do the best by myself, which will be the thing that will be the best for the people who I'm connected to and I want to take care of. I mean, I could keep talking, Indira, but I think rather than that, what I want to say to the listeners is that Indira has given us so much of wisdom, so many thoughts. She's thought a lot about this idea of challenging herself when she's faced with call it a crisis, call it call it whatever you like, a hurdle, whichever way you want to look at it. And how then do you believe in yourself? How then do you grow? And of course, Indira has written a book. Now, the book, Fast Forward to Hope, Choosing to Build the Power of Self, is actually being launched on the week of the 26th of April. Hooray! And <laughs> Thank you. if any one of you want to read it anywhere in the world, because I do know that many parts of the world are, are, are listening in on this podcast. It's available on Amazon. I know Amazon, I'm sorry, but it's, <laughs> it's available everywhere in the world. And it starts off as an ebook. So all you have to do is download it somewhere and you can hear Indira's book. 
Indira, is it in your voice, the book? In your no, the audio book? The audio, the audio book will come in a couple of months, in a few months. Ah, okay. You're reading yes. it as an ebook. Okay. Yes. And That's then hopefully, right. can we hear your voice reading it too? Not this time. Not till I get the audio book out. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. You can see I still hold books in my hand. I'm old fashioned. <laughs> yes. But I'm, then, of course, at some point soon, there'll be an audio book. There'll also be an old fashioned hardback copy, which you can hold in your hand and read. So um, certainly for any one of us who feel, how can we build the power of ourselves? I would urge you to go out and buy that book. But other than that, uh, Indira, Indira Aluvalia, thank you so very much for sharing your stories and your stories of unconscious bias with me. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you for giving me the space to be myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I'm Smitha Tharoor. If you like this episode, please do share with a friend or colleague. It's only by sharing that more people will know of it. You can find out about previous episodes and the next ones by following me on Twitter or Instagram at Smitha Tharoor. The next episode will be in a week's time.